from Studio D. Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. We're so glad you joined us. And today we're right back into the great book of Zechariah chapter 6. And remember what Zechariah means in the Hebrew. It means remembered of Yah. In other words, it's the time that God remembers His covenant and His promises and He returns to His children. That's the subject matter of the entire book of Zechariah. In chapter 6, the prophet has his eighth and his final vision of the end times. The time we're in now, ladies and gentlemen, and he sees in this vision four chariots. And you will recall that the number four in biblical numerics refers to all things pertaining to the earth, the four directions, the four seasons, the four winds. Oh, and don't forget the four tops. <laughs> and in the vision, these four chariots are carrying the four spirit winds of heaven, which are the uh, ones we studied earlier back in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 6, who are going to execute judgment over the entire earth, which will bring an end to this flesh age. And that is the time frame of chapter 6. So if you don't know the time frame you're in, you don't really know what you're reading. Okay? That's why I'm careful to change and let you know what the time frames are. This lecture is going to shift from the flesh age over in a moment to the first day of the millennium. So you want to be ready for it so you'll know what's going on. So Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 1 and it reads, <clears throat> The prophet says, And I turned and li lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold there came four chariots out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of brass. And these mountains uh, are nations. And brass means that they're very hard. And they're both very important nations. And I'm going to fast forward you and just tell you from prophecy that these two nations are the United States of America and Russia, the two great superpowers of the end times. And when we get to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, you're going to see this. And there's nothing new under the sun that our Father has not warned us about. How did He do this? Through the prophets, of course. <clears throat> now, you will remember from chapter 1, if you've been studying along with us, that we had four horses and four horsemen that were what in chapter 1? They were scouts. They were scouting angels that God sent to and fro through the earth to check on the state of the people uh, just prior to the end of the earth age. But in this, in chapter 6, in this chapter, these are not scout angels. These are war angels. They're war chariots. They're pulling war chariots. It's time for war. Verse 2, in the first chariot were red horses. And do you know what red, the color red means? It means war. <clears throat> these are war horses. And in the second chariot, black horses. The third chariot were white horses. The fourth chariot were grizzled or gray and bay horses. And uh, <clears throat> verse 4, Then I answered and I said unto the Lord that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? What is this army all about? Listen carefully. And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. These are the four spirit winds, the four winds, the Ruach in the Hebrew, which means these four angels, these four winds from heaven are going to bring an end to the flesh age. That's why they're here. <clears throat> and they're riding in those chariots, these four war chariots. Now, we know from our prior studies uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1 that these are not wooden chariots and flesh horses. These are interdimensional flying crafts, able to enter the earth dimension of time, back into heaven, and back and forth. Interdimensional flying vehicles. These are the same four spirit winds that you read of, that you'll find in Revelation chapter 7, Ezekiel chapter 37, <clears throat> and Daniel chapter 7. And in each book, they always have to do with the consummation of this age. And this is God talking, not me. These are the same four spirit winds that are called the four carpenters that fray the four horns back in Zechariah chapter 1. But now we see who they really are. 
<clears throat> they're war angels. And when those four winds blow from all four directions and blow and center in and concentrate on one spot on this earth, it's going to bring on one thing, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to bring on the birth of a new age. The age of the Spirit. Verse 6. The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, <clears throat> and the white go forth after them for support. And the grizzled and the gray go forth toward the south country. Verse 7, And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Notice something here. <clears throat> There's one set of horses that he forementioned that were not sent out. It's the red horses, the war horses. He didn't send out the war horses, the red ones. And do you know why he didn't send them out? It's because God is going to take care of that particular war himself up close and personal. It's a special war to him. And when you read Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, okay, you will be very aware of this fact. Because it all stems, the reason he's in this conflict himself, is it all stems from a conflict that God himself wants to settle and put an end to, and he's going to do it personally. And this is not a new conflict, not at all. It started back in Genesis chapter 25. At the birth of two sons, <clears throat> Jacob and Esau. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Jacob, who became the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, and Jacob's older brother is Esau, who sold his birthright blessing to his younger brother Jacob. He came in from hunting. Esau did, and he was all tired and hungry. And he sold his birthright <clears throat> that God gave him for a bowl of red bean soup. Why? Because Esau did not value his birthright from God. And what happens next is prophesied in Genesis chapter 27. The fact that God would bless Jacob and his descendants, but for Esau and his descendants, they would live away from the fat of the land, living far, far to the north where it's cold <clears throat> and the land is not very good. And those same people, down to this time, have struggled ever since, even to this day, even though they do have a strong military. <clears throat> so Esau hated Jacob for this, and still does to this day. Let's take a look at him. <clears throat> Shall we? All across the country. Here you go. Look at him. Tell us. Now, <clears throat> that birthright blessing that fell, Jacob's Birthright, birthright blessing that he got from his father fell on the 12 tribes of Israel. And of those 12 tribes, there are two birthright nations. And the descendants of those two birthright nations are the United States and Great Britain. Long live the king. Long live the queen. And of those two, the United States is the most powerful and the most wealthy. Esau's descendants migrated north into what is now the nation of Russia. So we have these two great mountains of brass of the end times, the USA and Russia, okay? The two great superpowers of the end time. And in Ezekiel 39, God addresses America as the leader of the ten northern tribes of Israel, not Judah. <clears throat> That's a whole different set of prophecies. America, in prophecy, is addressed as Israel. They are spiritual Israel. And God addresses Russia, as you're going to see, as Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And you'll find out who that is in a moment. <clears throat> so here we have these two great mountains of brass, right at the time of the end. And the prophet Zechariah sees these four chariots of war come out from between those two mountains of brass. And again, God sent the black horses out. He sent the white ones out. He sent the gray and the bay out. 
But he did not send the red horses out. And again, why? <clears throat> because this is the battle. This is the age-old conflict that the Almighty is going to take care of himself. And it has to do with that conflict we read about here in Genesis 25. <clears throat> and my friend, God's got a good memory. And you're going to see how he does it and why he does it. And for all this information and to see our immediate future, quite frankly, turn to Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel chapter 39. <clears throat> also, while you're turning there, I'll just tell you that the entire book of Ezekiel is addressed exclusively to Israel, the ten northern tribes, not Judah. Okay? Judah and Benjamin split off from the ten tribes much earlier. <clears throat> so you must rightly divide the scriptures when you're studying, especially prophecy. You've got to know what Israel means and what Judah means. Otherwise, you don't know who you're reading about. Chapter 39 and verse 1. Therefore, thou son of man, this is Ezekiel, prophesy against Gog and say, thus saith the Lord, behold, I am against thee. Okay? He didn't stutter. O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Gog is a symbolic name of the nations that lie just north and east of the tiny country of Israel that lies in the Middle East. And Gog is the far north in the modern times. Gog is the far north eastern part of Turkey and all of what is now the nation of Russia. And Magog is symbolic of the same lands and the same people. And this chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, very important. The word chief in the Hebrew language is Rush, which is the ancient name of Russia. And prince in the Hebrew is king or ruler. And Meshach is the ancient name of the modern city of Moscow. <clears throat> and Tubal is the ancient name for the modern city of Tobolsk a sister city to Moscow in Russia that used to be, was the ancient capital of Siberia, which of course is part of <clears throat> Russia. So this chief prince of Meshach and Tubal is the absolute ruler of Russia and the Russian people. And today, my friend, that man is Vladimir Putin. And if he is the last chief prince over Russia, and I think that it is highly possible that he is, and if that turns out to be the case, then Vladimir Putin is one of the biggest signs in your Bible that shows you just how close we really are <clears throat> to the second return of Jesus Christ. So, in verse 1, God has left no question about who it is that he is against. So let's read it again, verse 1. And watch how many times God uses the word I in this chapter. Ezekiel 39 and verse 1, Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Verse 2, and I, here we go again, God will turn thee back and leave but a sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. <clears throat> and again, he's addressing prophetic Israel, the ten tribe people and where they migrated to, not Judah. And the northern mountains of the prophetic Israel are in Alaska. Our, our 49th state. <clears throat> he was either 49 or 50. I think it's 49th. And what is Russia coming over those mountains of Israel to do? To make war with Jacob's descendants, who is America, and destroy it. And God is not going to stand for it. <clears throat> and you're going to find out that this final battle between America and Russia... It's called Haman Gog. <clears throat> now, happening at the same time, 
is another battle in the Eastern Hemisphere <clears throat> that is taking place in Jerusalem called Armageddon. And all those prophecies pertain to Judah, not Israel, <clears throat> even though it's happening in the little country of Israel. See how you can get confused? So God did not leave America out of these prophecies. You know, I used to hear all the time, how come America's not mentioned? It's all through here, if you know, where the, if you know who they are. And when it comes to Armageddon, what's going to happen there? Well, Christ Himself is going to take care of that battle. So both of these battles are going on at the same time. Russia's involved in both of them. In fact, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal is in charge of both battlefronts. <clears throat> and next is what God is going to do to the old chief prince and his army as they fly over the northern mountains of Alaska. Verse 3. Ezekiel 39, verse 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. God speaking, and I, this is the fourth time he said it, will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. These are missile launchers and aircraft. And I will cause thine arrows, that's the bombs and the missiles, to fall out of thy right hand. So this is going to be an all-out aerial assault that quite frankly will never reach us. Why? Because the Almighty Himself <clears throat> is going to destroy them and we won't have to fire a shot. And if you look in Ezekiel 38, down at verse 22, you're close to there. That verse will tell you just how God is going to do this. 38, 22, and I, God again, will plead against him, the chief prince, with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain down upon him and upon his bands an overflowing rain and great hailstones, Fire and brimstone. He's pretty clear how he's going to do it. Hmm. Exact same way Egypt and Sodom went. There you go. In, in Revelation 16, verse 21, <clears throat> it'll tell you that those hailstones will be the weight of about one talent, ranging anywhere from 120 to 180 pounds, that will take care of the missiles and the aircraft and any personnel that's coming over those northern mountains. Can you imagine flying at six, seven hundred miles an hour? And here comes a hundred and eighty pound hailstone, solid ice, right in your windshield. Curse flat. It don't matter what they send. They'll never get here. <clears throat> so what happens next? Verse 4. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel. Thou and all thy bands, <clears throat> and the people that is with thee. God says, I'm going to get them all. I ain't going to leave one of them. Now, either God's telling the truth, or He's telling a lie. And God don't lie. I, God said, will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beast of the field, to be devoured. Oh, yeah. And when these giant hailstones hit their aircraft, and their old missiles, and their personnel... Coming over those mountains. Hey, where are they going to fall? God covers it. Verse 5. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, the open plains of Canada and Montana, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Pretty clear, don't you think? And let me say this. God loves the Russian people. Okay, <clears throat> He's not against the Russian people. This is against Russia's terrible, lawless government and their evil leader, Mr. Putin, if that's who it turns out to be. Not the people. Russia has many devout Christians in it. it they really do. <clears throat> so he's not against them. Verse 6, And I, number nine times, he says, I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, these are maritime nations, who side with Russia, <clears throat> and they shall know that I am the Lord. Large caps in the Lord means His sacred name. 
So actually what this says in the early manuscripts, and they shall know that I am Yahovah. Woo! No more hiding. Is God real? I don't know. I don't believe in no God. I mean, you run into this all the time. But when this day comes, everybody going to know that He is God and His name is Yahovah. <clears throat> That's His point here. Verse 7, So I, number 11, will make my holy name known. And what is the sacred holy name of God? We just read, we just said it. It's Yahovah. God told Moses, my name is Yahovah. So, God says, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. <clears throat> Continue verse 7. And I will not let them pollute my name anymore. Now, he, he called us out here. You hear that? I'm not going to take this from Israel anymore. I'm not going to let them <clears throat> pollute my holy name anymore. You see, at this time, most of Israel, i.e. America and Great Britain, and Judah, a tiny little nation in Israel, are backslidden. And you can see it today. And the heathen. Now he's going to cover the heathen. He's just left all the, you know, Weak believers. Now he's going to cover the heathen. God says, that's all the spiritual lost people in the world. And the heathen shall also know that I, number 13, am Yahovah, the Holy One of Israel. <clears throat> and now you know why God did not send the red horses out. It's because he's going to take care of this battle himself <clears throat> so that every person on the earth will know that Yahovah is the Holy One of Israel and the only one true God of heaven and earth. And boy, are they going to be shocked. He's going to make His name known to every person on this earth, saved or lost. <clears throat> They're going to know. There will be no more doubting who God is. And now, you know why He takes the war horse, uh, he, he, he takes care of this battle Himself, <clears throat> And you know how he does it, the hailstones and the rain. And you know where he does it, Haman God, okay? And that puts you one up. If you know these questions, if you know why he's going to take care of this war himself, and you know where he's going to take care of this war himself, and you know how he's going to do it, ladies and gentlemen, that puts you one up on most Christians. Why? Because most ministers don't teach the prophets and they don't teach God's prophecies. Amen. And that's a shame. <clears throat> so after God finishes the war, <clears throat> excuse me, what happens next? 39 and 8. Behold, it is come and it is done, God says, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I, number 14, have spoken. And what day is he talking about here? This is the prophetic day of the Lord. It's the seventh trump. It's the day of Christ's return. It's the day when all souls are changed from a flesh existence to a spiritual existence. We're done with the flesh right here. It's the first day of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and from verse 9 on, we are in the millennium. Keep that in your mind. And all flesh is gone. It's history. Life is now a spiritual existence in spiritual bodies after this war. So think spiritually with me right here, please, or you won't understand it. Verse 9. And they that dwell in the cities of what? Israel shall go forth and set on fire and burn. Understand, this is a cleansing that's going on through the millennium. And set on fire and burn both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with what? With fire. For how long? 
Seven years. Now, listen closely. This is not spiritual fire that they're using here. We're in the spiritual world now. This is spiritual fire that they're cleansing with. And the spiritual fire of God is what? It's His glory. And the prophet Habakkuk spoke this on the day of the Lord. He says, on the day of the Lord in Habakkuk 2.14. And he said, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And the glory of God is the fire of God. And it is also His presence. It's also the presence of God Almighty. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen. This is the cleansing of the turmoil and the hatred of man's warring for 6,000 years. And it's over right here. And this seven years, I believe, is not seven man years, but I believe it is seven periods of time. 7,000 years. Seven millennia. Again, think spiritually. It's 6,000 years of men warring with themselves and 1,000 years that is necessary for the cleansing through that 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. So that they shall take no wood out of the field. Okay, so they're not gathering wood for the fire. Neither cut down any of the forest. Not using that for fire. For they shall burn the weapons with fire. So from this verse, it's not a natural wood fire because it's not natural fire at all that they're burning these metal weapons with. It's the fire of God. It's His glory that's on His election at that time. And they shall spoil those that spoil them and rob those that rob them saith the Lord God. Does that make sense to you? <clears throat> In other words, we're talking about the millennium. It's a time of teaching and correction. It's a time of cleansing. It's a time of peace and of conversion and salvation. And yes, there will be more people saved during the millennium than at any other time. And it's not a second chance. But it's the fact that most of them never had the first chance. Verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day, in the millennium, the day of the Lord, that I, number 15, will give unto Gog, that's old Russia, a place there of graves in Israel. It ain't over there, it's over here. The valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, east of the Pacific, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, <clears throat> and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog, which means the multitude of Gog or Russia. And this does consummate the end of the flesh age and the millennial reign of Christ begins and with that time frame in mind <clears throat> now I want you to return to Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 8 we'll finish the chapter because from verse 8 on this is going to be in the millennium too Zechariah 6 <clears throat> and verse 8 Then he cried, then cried he upon me, and he spoke unto me, saying, Behold those that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. This is God talking. All that bunch that came up over the north, you know, I put the whammy on them, I took them out. He says, Behold those that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. And here, God's own spirit, His Ruach, He's got it under control. His wrath and His vengeance is over. That's what those two battles are about, Haman, Gog, and Armageddon. It's the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb. And here, 
It's over with. And he says, my spirit is quietened. And everything is just fine. And as we just read in Ezekiel chapter 30, uh, 39, the way God does it, it's not going to take but a few minutes for our Father <clears throat> to set things right. So at this point, God's wrath is over right here. And that's why He's quieted. He settled that conflict. Verse 9. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Oh boy, the prophet just keeps going. Now he's in the millennium. Here we go again. Listen closely. <clears throat> Verse 10. Take of them of the captivity. What he wants, to, what he wants them to do is uh, he wants them to take up an offering. Okay? Take of them of the captivity, even of Heldiah. Now when you get to names in your Bible, you need to look up the names and see what they mean. Because the meaning is in the name. They were named that way to, on purpose. <clears throat> Take of them of the captivities, even of Heldiah. Heldiah means the worldly. Okay? Those that live sinfully. Those are them that wake up on the first day of the, end of the millennium where they live forever body and they still have a libel to die so. They got a thousand years of hard school in front of them. But he said, take from them, okay, take from the worldly, and of Tobijah. Now he shifts gears. Tobijah means the goodness of Yah. So take from my people too. And of Jedidiah. Jedidiah means the praise of Yah, which are come from Babylon, in our case, out of that five-month period. So it's all over right here. The captivity, the five months of the locust army and Satan running the show is all over right here. And, and come thou the same day and go into the house of Josiah, which means the healed of Yah, the son of Zephaniah, which means the hidden ones of Yah, and the hidden ones of Yah are the hidden ones of God, are His election. So, <clears throat> we see God is taking up an offering here from the ones who still have liable to die souls, the worldly, and He's taking them up from His people at the very beginning, at the very start of the millennium. But why is He taking up an offering? Verse 11. Then take silver and gold, obviously from the offerings, and make what? Crowns, plural. And why are the elect making crowns at this time? We're taking over, baby. We're taking over right here. You understand? And set them upon, we don't wear them, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And we know from Zechariah chapter 3 that Joshua is who? It's Jesus, our high priest. Verse 12, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. And we know from Zechariah 3 that the man whose name is branch is Jesus, that branch that is a shoot from the root of Jesse, who is the father of King David. He... Jesus shall go up out of His place and He shall build the temple of the Lord. Millennial temple. This many-membered body temple of Christ made up of living stones. Verse 13. Even He shall build the temple of the Lord and He shall bear the glory. And oh boy. <clears throat> and shall set and rule upon His throne that means He's King of kings. And He shall be, read it, priest upon His throne. So He's both King and priest. And the council of peace that's going to be going on as part of that cleansing process through that final thousand years shall be between them both. And Jesus Christ is King of kings and He is our priest. And according to Luke chapter 3, Mary's father was of the tribe of Judah. And Mary's mother was of the tribe of Levi. 
the priest corps. Therefore, Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek meaning king, and Zedek meaning priest. And Jesus is the king of kings, and he is our high priest. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. And we see him wearing these multiple crowns in your Bible. Where do we see these multiple crowns on Christ? In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 12. Verse 14. And the crowns, listen to what these crowns designate. And the crown shall be helim. So you got to look these words up. Helim means power. And another crown is to Tobijah, which means the goodness of God. And another to uh, Jedediah, which means the praise of Yah. And to Hen. See, Hen wasn't mentioned in the other scripture a while ago. It's been added in here. Why? Because this is after the cross. Why is that? To Hen, which means grace. He brought the grace to us after the cross. The son of Zephaniah, the hidden, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Woo-wee! <clears throat> is this making sense to y'all out there? Wow. I understand that this is deeper stuff. This is deeper water than you're going to walk, in, walk through in most Sunday schools. And I'm not knocking Sunday school I think Sunday school is a good thing. I think anything and anywhere where they're talking and lifting up God is a good thing. But you know what? <clears throat> we live right at the end of this flesh age. Ladies and gentlemen, and without the knowledge from these prophets, you are not going to know exactly what's going on. And if somebody's up there teaching something and you think, yeah, that sounds good, but you don't check it out, you still may not know. This is why I take the time. <clears throat> to bring all this up so that you will know we're coming down to the end here we're, verse <clears throat> 15 again and they that are far off shall come I guess we didn't read that one here we go they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord and you shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. Oh, Zechariah. Man. Woo! He's saying, I'm prophesying to you now, but when we get to this day, you're going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what God told me to say is exactly what's going to happen, and now is exactly what happened. Hallelujah. And this, now watch this. you got to watch words. And this shall come to pass. We're in the millennium, right? This shall come to pass. If, the biggest two-letter word in the Bible, if, now watch, you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So, what does that tell you? You can see here that even during the millennial reign of Christ, the people still have a free will. So you got to, you know, you still have a free will there and you still got to keep serving God, okay? Hallelujah. And this ends, <clears throat> this concludes the sixth chapter of Zechariah along with the prophet's eighth and final vision that is recorded in this great book. And I hope I did a good enough job to separate the prophecies for Israel and who they are, and the prophecies for Judah and who they are, even though they're all of the same family. And you know what else is going to happen after all this? It's not in this lesson, but what else is going to happen? These ten are going to be united with these two. These two sticks, Judah and Israel, bam, they're going to be put back together. That too is in Ezekiel chapter 37, but I can't teach the whole Bible in one sentence. Wish I could, <laughs> but I can't. Amen. So, Judah's going to get back. Judah and Benjamin, they're going to get back with the other ten. Hey, we're going to spend eternity together. And what? A complete story. These eight visions tell. Mm -mm -mm. 
having to do with our current generation, giving to us the major events that lead up to the end of the flesh age and what the first day of the millennium actually looks like, who overcomes and who doesn't. And this information is vital, ladies and gentlemen. And anyone who wants to be an overcomer and sit on that throne of David with Christ and rule and reign with Him for a thousand years, you've got to do it now. That you've got to you've got to become an overcomer now. You got to get in the Word and find out what's going on. Find out what God wants you to do and be be obedient to it. Okay. And oh yeah, these visions are all about that. They're all about this time that we're living in. <clears throat> Which is why. Okay? Which is why. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me take just one drink here and I'll, I'll wrap this up. Amen. Which is why. My beautiful wife and I have worked up what we call the cliff notes, okay, right here, to Zechariah's eight visions. That's right. And a short description, okay, of each vision. And it also comes with pictures, and they're, they're more helpful than you think, it comes with pictures that depicts each one of Zechariah's visions. And then, of course, it comes with the description. <clears throat> Why do we do this? Why do we go to this time to do this? It's so that six months from now, or a year from now, you can pull up those cliff notes, and in a matter of minutes, you can brief yourself or someone else i.e. your children, as to what these visions mean and which one we are about to step into next. And I sincerely hope that you will ask for these cliff notes to Zachariah's visions. And all of our literature is absolutely free. All you got to do is just send a postcard or a letter <coughs> to this address right here <coughs> and request the cliff notes to Zachariah's visions. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to get it right out to you. My wife's got them stacked up right over there on the desk right now. And she's got them ready to go out. We just don't know your address yet. Send it to us. We'll get it right there. This, this, this information here is a snapshot, really, of the first six chapters of this book. So, and I promise you, down the road you're going to be glad you got them. Because all you got to do is turn the TV on, watch the news. You can see things closing in. Things are closing in big time. And uh, if you are enjoying our Dove Point lectures, tell a friend about us, won't you do that? And hit that subscribe button for us, please. And don't miss the next lecture from Zechariah chapter 7, which contains instructions, more instructions for us today that come about from Israel's past mistakes, making sure that we don't make the same mistakes they did in our generation as we sail off into our captivity of that final five months of flesh. See the correlation? Plus, we are also going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the Lord's Feast of Trumpets. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. So, from our local congregation who has supported this ministry from the very beginning in 1997, who without their support, there would be no Dove Point Bible study today. And from our production crew, whose sacrifice has meant so much through the years, who without them, there would be no recordings and no YouTube broadcast going out to the world. So, from all of us, to all of you, we thank you for watching wherever you are. Until next time, my friends.
Shalom and Shalom.